in verse 9. Uh, keep your spot, though, in that First Kings text. We're going to get there, I think, by the end of this uh, this morning as well. And as you get your way to First Peter chapter 1, verse 10, it's really the end of verse 9. I kind of want to lift up as our opening kind of contemplation moment. It just says there, the salvation of your souls. So this is what he's been talking about up to this point. And it's been a blessing. You know, that same word Jesus preaches, makaritloi, beatitude, blessing. Uh, verse 3, it is blessed be God. Right? But now, this salvation of your souls, the reason I want to dwell on that for a second isn't because I want to dwell on salvation. I want to dwell on the, the idea of your soul, actually. I don't think salvation is such a strange concept to most Christians. Um, it's sort of like the retirement package for earth, right? Like uh, it's sort of the, the last hundred years of Christianity. Salvation is, you know, if you if you believe in Jesus, after you retire, after you die, you get like a better retirement, right? And, and if you don't believe in Jesus, well, then you go to hell. And that's sort of the gospel for a lot of people, which it's not like that's not true. All of it's really true. It's just sort of narrow. Uh, to live in, in that way of thinking about it, uh, as if it's all just about later, really, but now is fine. Everything here is fine. We just need to be saved later, right? And let me suggest that if you think that or feel that, you just don't think about your soul enough. And maybe you don't even believe you have one. Uh, you know, or if you have one, I mean, do you, do you think about that every day? How often does the word soul? How's my soul? It is well, it is well with my soul. Is that part of your language? And if you don't use that word to talk about yourself, what do you use? Your conscience? That's good. That's close. That's a big, fancy word to throw around too, though, right? It is well as well with my conscience, you know, uh, as well with my soul. Uh, the salvation of your soul then. And, and the idea that your soul, what, what is it technically? To, to get down to that is precisely the problem. Uh, the word soul is an English way of talking about something that both the Hebrew and the Greek try to talk about but can never really nail down because... <laughs> It's a soul. <laughs> it's a spirit. It's not physical. But it's more than just your spirit. Just your spirit. That's like your breath. <sighs> right? When God takes back his spirit, I won't breathe anymore. My spirit will be gone. So I have a spirit, but my spirit is just kind of part of my soul. Because the way that both Greek and Hebrew think about the soul, my body is part of my soul too. And that's where English is just all off. Because in English, body and soul means like two different things, right? They're like opposites of each other. And, and in the ancient mind, at least, your body is just kind of like the outside of your soul. Which, if your body like falls apart and dies, that would tell you there's something wrong with your soul. Everybody. <laughs> everybody, right? Uh, the salvation of your soul. Oh, this means the salvation of every single last piece of you. From your pinky fingernail all the way down to your deepest hearts, dreams, and desires, your deepest fears, those are going to be saved from, your greatest uh, loves, those are going to be saved for, right? Salvation of your soul. And then I want to drive at this idea then that we're not waiting for this. We're waiting for Jesus to come back, and I want us to look with ardent fervor for his glory as a period, as the revelation of the day of greatness. Like We want to do this. And then if it's not today, we want to remember that it is today for all of us when we say so. Jesus doesn't have to come back to be king. He's king right now. And the greater things than he, which the church will do, which he promises is strictly this, to continue going on when it looks like there's no hope. Because we know he's in charge. That he's the king. And that our souls are going to do well through whatever may come. It matters not. All my fears, they come true. It is well for my soul. It's a gift from Jesus to teach me if I believe it. But it takes the faith to believe it to start to look for it. And the natural man doesn't do that. That's what Paul, Peter, excuse me, now is going to talk about. Is that, well, now we're not just natural men. You still have the natural man inside of you. You still carry the chains of your flesh about you. Your heart cannot be trusted 100%. Not at all. Huh? Um, but that doesn't mean it's not being changed by day to day, glory to glory. Lots of gospel, truly. Um, so here we go then, the salvation of your souls. Of this salvation, we're going to talk about it, right? The prophets have inquired and searched carefully who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, right? So 
everybody who wrote anything down about Jesus before he came, the Old Testament prophets, they wrote it down because it was about salvation for you, for you. And they prophesied grace. Not more rules, not an iron fist, but grace, right? That's the salvation. It's by grace. They, knowing this, searched what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. So that is a pretty complicated sentence, but the idea is that, you know, so Isaiah is like, the virgin will conceive and behold a child and, and all this stuff to Ahaz. And then, you know, three days later, he's like, oh, okay, I think that meant this, but I it seems to me something more than just that, right? And so Isaiah starts to, in his own life, his own walk with Jesus, he has to go back to his own preaching and look at it because he knows it's about something bigger. And that thing already came now. We're not waiting for that anymore. We really aren't. It's, it's when Jesus came. And I get it, the end of the world is a big deal too, but it's, it's kind of secondary to the fact that he already won. It's the revelation of what, what he achieved for our eyes, but our eyes are nearly as important as our bodies. And our bodies have it already through faith alone. But that's not a weak thing. Just because faith is passively received doesn't mean it's weak when it gets on fire. It, it burns hot. So again, they wanted that. They searched for Christ and to see when it would come, right? They knew that the Messiah would suffer. He also says that very clearly just in that verse, right? That they, when they looked at their own prophecies, they understood this Messiah will not be uh, Alexander the Great. Uh, he will not be Julius Caesar. Uh, uh, he would suffer, and uh, and then the glory would follow. Uh, he is risen. Hallelujah. I forgot that one all day today. Second Sunday of Easter. Somebody slap me next time. Goodness. Um, so uh, verse 12, to them, the prophets, is where we picked up the text in our reading. So to the prophets, it was revealed not to themselves, but to us they were ministering, right? So they look at the text, and they're able to say, oh, it's bigger than just me. It's bigger than just me. They're ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. And that's a nice place to go a little backwards here. What is it that angels long to look into? What, when they're bored, right? It's Friday night. Angel Bob gets off work. What's he going to go do now, right? What does he want to go find? Right? And it tells us here, um, to them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us, they were ministering. That's, that's the angel language there. Serving the things which have now been reported to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. So I'm going to suggest there's at least two things there, maybe more. The first one is that the Holy Spirit has come down in heaven to land upon the man Jesus Christ. So what are the angels amazed by that God who made them is now one of us? Like, they're like, that's weird. Like, as well, we should a little bit, like, marvel at this, right? But then it's not just that. That by him doing that now, it's not just that Jesus came down, he's God, he's man, and he's alive. But now, his Holy Spirit from heaven, who also created us, he is God. This is nothing less than the full person of God. He comes down by the gospel, the good news, and goes inside of you. He incarnates you. It's another incarnation of Jesus Christ. His word and his sacraments in you. Not that you would replace him, but that you would live under him in his kingdom. Innocent, righteous, blessed, all those marvelous catechetical words. Yeah. So it was revealed to the, the prophets of old that Jesus Christ was going to bring about an outpouring of the Holy Spirit that would, frankly, give every single Christian the power of prophecy, which isn't the power to tell the future. We've talked about that before. I want to say it again. Like Christians aren't supposed to predict the future. We're not supposed to predict the future. It's not for us. It's not our work. We don't have the power to do that. And in fact, that's what witches do. That's what sorcerers do, is they try to control the future with secret powers and tell what's going to happen, you know, bet on the lottery ticket with more knowledge and all that kind of greedy nonsense. Yeah. So for our part, the Holy Spirit is given to us 
Not that we would tell the future, but that we would be content today. That we would know the future that matters, the day of Jesus is coming. Judgment day is going to take care of all of it. Nothing you have taken from you will not be restored 20 times, 20 fold, 100 fold. Right? It's all going to be better that day. So since we know that then, again, we may engage this day with a completely different attitude than the rest of the world who's got to live right now. Like their time is short. Fit it in you know, before it's over. We don't have to live like that. And that's, that's the salvation of your soul. You do not have to be worried. And hey, king of worry right here. King of worry. No one out there think, is, is actually, you don't have to share with me. I'm just, I'm saying I am king of worry. Like, like when I say you don't have to be worried, none of you get to be like, well, Pastor Fisk, you can say that. No, I can't say that. That's the thing. It's the promise of Jesus. I don't have to be worried. If I'm worried, guess what I'm doing? Wasting my time. <laughs> you know, sinning. Not in a way where I'm going to lose my faith. I'm just not going to like see how good it is most of the time. There's a real distinction between moral sin that drives your faith out and stupidity that is in fact sin, but it's just going to like hurt more. We talked about anger earlier, right? The, the, the difference between being a man who can have cool anger and being a man who only has hot anger is the understanding that if I let my hot anger come out, I get hurt. Because I hurt everybody else and they turn on me. But if I can learn that and then have my anger become cool anger, I can be cool and still get it done. In fact, the anger is the motivation to find a better way than just shouting at people about it, which quite clearly almost never works, right? Unless you're in the military or something and you're all on the same team, right? Coaches shout. Well, that's because everyone's listening. It's different in the home. Yeah. So, all right. Uh, angels long to look into how the Holy Spirit is going to inhabit your heart and change you to see things differently than the world around you. Anger being a good example from the Sermon on the Mount. Verse 13, therefore, since you know this, gird up, I love this, the loins of your mind. I mean, give yourself a visual image there, guys. Just do it. <laughs> gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober. And rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So, what's the revelation of Jesus Christ? Now, where is the grace going to be brought to you? And it begins with the last day, right? The sky is going to break open. He's going to come back. And all of us who are waiting for him and calling his name, even if we made a lot of mistakes, even if sometimes we say the wrong things, are going to be saved from whatever that day is bothering us. <laughs> whatever it is, that day, we'll be saved from it, right? But this is just a thing. That day is going to be great and glorious, but guess what? He saves you today too. Like you don't have to wait for that day for the revelation of Jesus Christ. You just have to open the Bible and believe it's true. Now the revelation of Jesus Christ is right in front of you to save you today. And let me suggest that it teaches you to pray to his name, call on him in trial trouble, praise and give thanks. And what you find is that he does. He saves you every day. Get up in the morning and say, Jesus, lead my day. You'll find out in the evening he did. If you pray again, Jesus, did you lead my day? Oh, he did. You know? It's about having the word of God on your lips again. And the more that the word of God is on your lips, the more you'll find God's in your life. And if you want other people's words on your lips, or if all you do is beam in sound from somebody else who's not a Christian, then that's what's going to be how you feel. Hmm. No, it's, it's, it's not rocket science. It's discipline. Gird up the loins of your mind. I mean, girding up your loins is, I can kind of do it for you here. So I mean, imagine that I've got to go to war right now today, okay? I'm, I'm an ancient man. I dress like this because that's what we all do. And so I've got to go to war. So, well, this is not going to work, right? If I have to run, I'm going to fall. So I got a belt up here, right? Pull this thing up into my little belt, shove it in. There we go. I girded up my loins. Let's do it, you know? It doesn't look like much. And theirs, they would have wrapped under probably. And as you get into armor and stuff, they're going to do more. But the idea is I'm getting ready to run. Right? Think about right now, if I run from here to there, and now I drop the, drop the alb, which has a little, and now I run from there to there, it's at least a second difference, probably. I'm pretty fast, but it's going to hold me back. And if I've got to like swing a sword, so, but he's not really telling you all, gird up your actual loins here. He says, gird up the loins of your mind. Get ready to run. Get ready to work. Get ready to understand. Planned to see, you know? expect 
to believe more. With this will come sobriety, which I emphasize does not mean you can't have one, two, or even sometimes, so not too often, three. Um, you can. Being sober is not never having a drink or being inebriated or feeling relaxed. Being sober is taking everything with the seriousness it deserves. So if I'm going to soberly watch my children play in a swimming pool with water balloons, it will involve laughter. If I'm going to soberly consider how to fight my enemy, it will not involve laughter. So the, the word doesn't mean like don't do this or don't do that. It means think a certain way. And let that be appropriate to the time. What's a drunk man do that's such a problem? Is it the alcohol as the, you know, the sugar carbon? Is, is that the problem? Or is it, it, it goes into the man and then what comes out of the man is the problem? And how many men can handle that much, right? That's just it. Alcohol is a very, very strong medicine and often a bad medicine. Right? But he's not condemning medicine. He's condemning stupidity. Huh? Be sober. Be sober. Think. Rest your hope fully upon the grace, the grace. So every time Jesus is revealed, whether it's the last day or whether it's today, when you say, Jesus, have grace, well, guess what? That was it. You called out for grace to Jesus. You had it already and more is coming. Set your mind on that. He's not against you. He's for you. He's not trying to trick you. He's calling you. He doesn't want to see if you mess up. Even when you collapse and do poorly, he's there trying to pull you back up more to show you how to learn from everything that you do. It goes on in verse 14, as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts as in your ignorance, right? So to see ourselves as, as children. Um, I was trying to imagine this a little bit uh, this morning. I don't know if I can recall it, but you know, I, you know, everyone likes the question, you know, how old are we going to be in heaven? Right. And when I die, if I die at 65, do I have to be 65 forever, right? Or do I, do I get to rise like at 23? Do we get to choose, you know, um, and all this? Um, but, you know, it's a fun question. We're all going to be children in the best sense of the term because we already are. I don't think that means we get small bodies, but maybe it does. I don't know. Um, but it means, you know how kids kind of just don't mind? Like just in the yard, run out with a tree or climb it, you know, like, like that. Right? They're like really so concerned about right, what it all means and how come and all this kind of stuff that in, in age we start to get all angry about why we don't have answers. You know, and then the children's minds are just, they don't worry about it. Why is this? Mom? Okay. And then they go off and they, again, they do whatever. So as obedient children, though, we're not just children, we're obedient. Our father's words we trust to be true. As obedient children, and then that means not conforming yourselves to the former lusts. Now here's a word which you know, again, it can have a sexual connotation, right? Lust in English means to want someone of, these days, animals, goodness gracious, opposites, everything. It's just disgusting what's out there. But, you know, to want somebody physically for sex. Um, the word, though, here has a lot more to do with just like the word passion, okay? Your passions, right? which uh, lust is a passion, to be sure, right? Uh, uh, but a passion is any emotion that sort of like rages out of you toward others. And that can be good. No, he has a passion for football. You know, that, that's not bad, okay? But the thing is, if your passions rule you, you will be dumb. You will be dumb. Well, I feel this, I feel that. Well, I always wanted this. I always wanted that. I always expected this. I always expected, okay, it's just going to hurt more. It's just going to hurt more. As opposed to realizing my passions are a bit uh, like a sea with a storm, even on the best days. Because I can be going along fine in a boat and there's a dark cloud and suddenly my passions are like zap at that, right? And you, you pick your favorite thing you mess up on and beat yourself up over. I don't know what it is, but it doesn't have to be lust, right? But what is the point here then that these lusts are ignorance, right? These passions are ignorance. They're your body acting like an animal. If you want to let the atheists say we're all monkeys and follow your passions, you'll see what it looks like when you get human monkeys. We're worse than the monkeys. And monkeys are awful, by the way. They're horrible. You ever try to like... Go look into how easy it is to have a monkey as a pet, not in terms of money, but in terms of the trouble they cause. My goodness. Anyway, and by the way, I had a monkey at my wedding, and it wasn't my monkey, if you can believe it. Ask Meredith. Um, so, uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, verse 15. Now, I, I should really be serious here. This verse is very much at the heart of it. Um, as he who called you is holy, 
you also be holy in all your conduct because it is written, you know, Torah, be holy for I am holy. So I thought we were saved by grace. How am I supposed to be holy then? Well, yeah. If you pit the thing against the thing, it's going to be a fight. It's not a fight. And, and holiness isn't righteousness either, which is important to say. So, you know, judging your works, you know, how righteous a person are you? Well, how honorable are you? When you tell someone yes, does it mean yes or is it doesn't mean sometimes? And do you have excuses you make all the time? Well, then you're not as righteous as you should be. You know, it's not your own, not your fault. Okay, you're a victim, but, but then you're not very righteous about it, right? So that's righteousness. And again, we're not going to be saved by our righteousness. Our dignity cannot save us. Our pride cannot save us. Our strength cannot save us. We must be saved by the righteousness of Christ. And his atoning sacrifice for the sins of the world on the cross, that is the final payment. That's justice. It's done. Okay. So that's righteousness. Holiness is different. A righteous person in God's world is going to be righteous because he is holy. I'm going to suggest holiness comes first, not second. No, it's not first you get justified, then you get sanctified. It's more you get sanctified and then you get justified. But see, most people use sanctified to talk about good works, which is then going to confuse the whole situation. Yeah. So again, what does it mean to be holy versus what does it mean to be righteous? And it's better to be holy than righteous because the holy is going to wear off on righteousness. It's going to become more righteous over time. The holiness is what sends the unrighteousness scattering. Yeah? And, and what is holiness? My, the best way to say this, um, it's, it's incomplete. Okay? So you can, you can find a flaw in this simple answer. Um, but it does go a long way toward the idea for you. And that is, uh, holiness is about proximity. It's like, it's, it's a physical word, right? So to again, demonstrate out of the pulpit here, because this is a holy table, because this is designated to be holy bread and wine. Therefore, for like the next 15 minutes, I'm more holy than you. Because I'm standing right here, and you're standing over there. So I have a robe on. As you all know, I'm not doing this on my own, right? Like, I'm getting close to the thing, right? There's stairs to go up, right? It's to demonstrate holiness, proximity to what? God, actually, though. So holiness is how close you are to God. Are you wicked and holy? It can't be. Can't be. If you're holy, you're going to be made righteous. He says, try to be holy, then. What does that mean, right? What does that mean? Be holy for I am holy. It means get near to God, which is what you're doing when you study the Bible and what you're doing when you have the Lord's Supper, which is why it makes sense to have it show the holiness here in this sanctuary, this holy room that we're in, right? So be holy. Now, I've taught you this word a different way before too, and um, this is really ground into our identity at St. Paul as a congregation, and I'm very thankful for that. Every year, we have a very holy time. It's not Christmas and not Easter. Those are holy too. Um, but we have a holy time. We even call it holy. Every year, we call it holy. And we spend a whole month on holy until we have a big meal that we call the holy main event. We just say it in English a little more cleanly. We call it set apart, which is literally what the word means. So to be holy is to be set apart. Think about proximity, right? Here's my pen, right? It is, it is over here, just common. Now I pick it up and I set it apart. It is now holy to me because I chose to put it where I wanted it to be. By its being near to me, I made it holy to me. Okay, so that's what God's doing to you. He's setting you apart. And he's saying, be set apart, because I'm set apart. And now Peter's just saying, so get ready for that one. Get ready for that one. That's it. You know, there's no, no list to check. It's just believe it. Believe it. Verse 17. And if, I'm going to say, since you call on the Father, who without, partial, without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear. Now again, if, since, the same word in Greek, and because I am a Lutheran, I like certainty. And so I don't want to insert doubt where there is none. Since you call on the Father, you do. That's not a question. No one in here is at church not calling on the Father of Jesus. So it's since. Uh, since you call on the Father, again, who without partiality judges according to each one's work? 
there's going to be a, a because or a reason that comes next. But this description of the father, I find to be very, very helpful. So honestly, if I'm honest with myself, really, I, I just don't know that I like, <laughs> it's hard to say. I don't like God very much. Um, I like Jesus a lot. <laughs> but like, God's scary. <laughs> and he does stuff to me all the time. And I, God, ah, why is he doing that to me? And, and, and all that. That's the father. Now, here's the key to not hating the father is to realize he really does judge without partiality. Without partiality. If I drop my cup, it's going to fall. Huh? If I go out, take off my pants and sleep with another woman, there's going to be problems in my life. Okay? It's, it's just, he, he judges without partiality. Your sin brings itself back in you. He doesn't have to keep track up in heaven. He's like checking it off. Oh my goodness, I almost didn't punish that guy today. Like, no, this is a program he built. It's better than a program, an algorithm, a design, you know? And so when we try to break it, it breaks back on us. Does that make sense? So since you call on the Father, who's going to just let whatever you do blow back on you in this world, well, then conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear. Because if you just go out and light fire to your house, it's going to burn down. Oh, we can have women pastors. It won't do anything. It's no problem. We know better now. <laughs> hundred years later, the whole country is falling apart. Whole country. It's amazing. Women pastors, 1960s. It's amazing. Is it the only reason? Ah, hmm. Probably more than one. Conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear. And I believe the Greek there, the language of stay is exile. It's actually the word, the time of your exile. You know, that's a throwback to Old Testament. Right? Whether we're talking about Babylon or talking about wandering in the wilderness, talking about Egypt, understand that we're still living in tents. We're still waiting for the final thing. And so our time is going to have more of like God being scary uh, than paradise will. But that's better than hating him. It's better to be scared of your father and know that he loves you than to be scared of your father and think that he hates you. And you know that he loves you, not because of the sun, which will turn dark tomorrow, God willing, but because of the son who died and rose again, Jesus Christ on the cross. That's how you know the father loves you. But now, since you know that, walk circumspectly. Be sober again. It's the same statement over and over, really. Uh, verse 18, knowing this, right? R remind yourself of this, that you were not redeemed with corruptible things. And I, as I've you know, tried to prepare for whatever I think about my life needs next, which you know, involves basic safety needs for my family and, and other things like that, you know, I, I've thought long and hard about diversifying our portfolio and, and having you know, assets where they need to be. I'm not at that place in life. I have to think about life insurance and all this kind of stuff. And it can really become quite a, quite a burden. You know, in a where... Where is it going to come from? We had enough this month, next month. Okay, we're doing good. We have to say, well, that was a bad month right there, right? Right. All that, corruptible things. Corruptible things. Every single one of them. How little Jesus cares. The worst part about set apart every year is we're still talking about money as if money is something that matters. It does matter, but it doesn't matter. Because Jesus has the money. And the more you believe that, the more you'll feel free to just kind of give yours away. And the more you give it away, you find out you have quite a bit more than you need, more than you thought. The only reason you don't have more than you think you need is because you think you need money for tomorrow and the day after and the week after and the year after and so on and so forth because you think you're on your own. <laughs> Some new deal. Some new deal. You were not redeemed with such corruptible things. Jesus has far greater in mind for you than the price of gold or Bitcoin. Yeah. Silver and gold, he mentions directly there. What are you redeemed from? Your aimless conduct. Remember, I talked about the passions, animal instinct, right? The lusts of the flesh. Your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers. Your fathers, if they're not wise, will actually teach you to be stupid. They will teach you to be stupid by being stupid themselves. And what's amazing in my experience as a father is a lot of the time, the worst stuff I say to my kids is the stuff I'm trying hardest to stop them from doing what I thought I did or, or so forth, right? So I'm so busy trying to keep them from being me accidentally, I can't see them. Hmm. That's a tradition I got from my father, personally. That's, that's the sin of my house before you all right now, 
Huh? And we work on it. We work on it. Uh, what's yours? What kind of tongue ruled the table when you were little? And have you ever asked, was that the same the generation before? Or did it become more kind and gentle through the Holy Spirit? And again, that's our task and endeavor in my home, is to realize that I've inherited a tongue that can be quite crisp. <laughs> it makes for good preaching. But it doesn't always make for the best well, constructive criticism of your project at homeschool, right? If you can imagine. Um, so uh, what's yours? How do you rein in the tongue? What do you have to stop saying? Sometimes you won't even know until you have a parent say it to you and you go, oh, I say that too. And you I don't like it how they said that to me, right? That kind of thing here. Um, uh, the tradition of our fathers, that, that we inherit sin and it really isn't the way we talk. It is. Um, but now, again, that's what we've been redeemed from. We're redeemed from it with the precious blood of Jesus, the Christ, right? So it's not about turn your tongue around or else. It's about, look, you got bought. You got bought. You were going to hell. He saw you. He bought you for his own, right? He, a lamb without blemish or without spot, all sorts of great atonement stuff there. Verse 20. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Uh, he's going to kind of move into a doxology here a little bit. And by him jumping to this foreordination before the beginning of the world, that's, that's quite a statement. This only shows up maybe two or three times in the Bible, but it is one of them. And, and all the times it agrees. And it's this. So, I mean, are you ready? This is where logic is going to fail us, all right? If you want to think like a Greek, you're going to lose. Um, God did not create evil in any way, shape, or form. But he planned for Jesus to die on the cross before he created anything. I mean, it's, it's one of the ones where like the atheist is going to be like, excuse me, talk too fast. The atheist is going to be like, that doesn't make sense. And so I won't believe it. I'm like, okay. But because I've done my research and I'm not, you know, this isn't the first thought I've had in Christianity. I'm actually believing things that are very reasonable. And now because of them, I'm not going to abandon them. And so when God says something I can't understand, rather than assume I'm a supreme being with all knowledge, I recognize that God is going to be able to say things I can't understand or he ain't God. You follow that? God is going to be able to say things you can't understand or he is not God. You are. Hmm? Jesus was crucified before the foundation of the world in the mind of the Father and he willingly took it on in the flesh. Manifested, right? Foreordained, planned, manifested. Actually did it in these last times, he says. Yeah. Speaking of the last times, notice how Peter calls it the last times. That was like 2,000 years ago. <laughs> yeah, we're in the last times. We've been in the last times. Uh, we should assume the end could be any time. We should assume the end could be a long time from now. And we should operate today as much as possible. But again, the manifestation of the Christ in flesh is the inauguration of the end of the world. It is. It's the beginning of the end of the world. Um, for you, though, for you, don't miss that, who through him believe in God. And so your faith in the Father who would crush you is now restored to understanding through Jesus who was crushed for you. God then raised him from the dead, gave him glory, so your faith and your hope are in, in God. Uh, faith and hope. I want to I jump to... Uh, 1 Kings 4, with our time here, because this belief in God, the action of, of living under God, simply, and not with adding too much to it, 1 First, First Kings 4 is going to give us this a little bit. So what's it look like? I just described, you know, the Christian mind a little bit. Uh, and, and that's very good, right? It was, it, was, it was intellectually satisfying, I hope. And you could write notes down and, and so forth. But like, you don't live that way. You don't, you don't live in your, I hope, you don't live in your own head. You live with everybody else. So what's it look like when you have girded up your mind 
When you, when you have prepared your heart to walk through the exile, uh, and you now, well, it's going to be Monday tomorrow, right? You're going to go home from church. It's going to be Monday tomorrow. What now? So 1 Kings 4 uh, gives us King Solomon's kingdom in a, in a nutshell. You know, last week we saw him enthroned. Uh, David's life was with us all the way through Lent. And this is to show that the promise is given to David that God would set on his throne a son of his own loins who would reign forever. And that this is Jesus. Solomon's a foreshadow, a prototype of Jesus. And his reign is a picture of what it's like to be in the kingdom of Jesus. And it's going to describe it in a very temporal way. And it's going to describe it as a time of peace. And while I think it's pretty easy for me as an American in 2024, I ran in the news last night. It's pretty easy for me to look at Solomon's time of peace and say, man, Jesus why can't we have like 40 years of that? Can we get 80 years of that? You know, um, why, why do we have to have something less than peace? But I do believe the wisdom of scripture is to know that while there may not be peace above you, it is whatever king is just above you may not be a man of peace. That doesn't mean you can't be a man of peace to those who are below you. So the kingdom of Jesus Christ is active wherever a Christian takes ownership of anything and shares and gives. And in this way, what is described here in Solomon's kingdom is not gone, is not missing, and it is in every Christian church that there is that's actually Christian. You're going to find Christians doing these things, and their lives and their homes are going to be like what this says. It's not going to be, you know, Solomon in all his glory. It's going to be enough for today, though. I want you to hear that, that this normal life that the people have under Solomon, Solomon gets all the money, you know, that's Jesus, but the life under Solomon, it's, it's a good life. It's a good life. Verse 20. 1 Kings 4.20, Judah and Israel were as numerous as the sand by the sea in multitude. Not only is this a fulfillment of uh, the promises given to Abraham, that his seed would be more than the stars, right? Uh, But also it's a fulfillment of Genesis chapter 1 and 2's promise that uh, God is going to fill the earth with mankind. Right? It's a blessing that we will be fruitful and multiply. Um, you know, right now, if if you're paying attention to uh, the people who are fighting over who's in charge of the narrative of what's going on in the world, <laughs> uh, one of the narratives that's most strongest, and it does have you know real, very powerful financial backing. I mean, Bill Gates, like personally, right, and and things like that. He's got a lot of money. Um, they really believe there's too many people on the planet. I mean, they just believe, they believe that for about 100 years now. You know, European elites, um, kings and queens and whatnot, they've been talking about it. There's a book written in the 80s, but before that, it's called Malthusianism, right? Even before World War I, the, the, the elites were all worried that we're going to have too many people, and so we're all going to die or something like that. I, and these are all atheists who don't think anything exists. I don't know why they care. But anyway, so the, the, the plan, again, uh, seems to be that they want less people on the planet right now. Birth control. Hello. Um, Notice that when God blesses Judah, there's not less people. There's more people. Hmm. Multiplication of humanity, contrary to arrogant foolishness, is really good for everybody unless the passions rule and there's no discipline. So I've seen families with 10 kids who don't discipline their kids, and it's not good. I've seen families with 10 kids who discipline their kids and they're going to change the world. It's a blessing to procreate, not a curse. And if you want to ask, where did we go, Christianity? Missouri Synod. Well, I know where we went. We stopped being. We thought it would be better to have less of us. And now we do. It's kind of a tough spot. Um, You can only have so many, you know. It's a blessing. Also then, eating and drinking and rejoicing. The point isn't just to have some kids because they're like gold or something, or maybe like in heaven, you get a better headdress because you had more kids or something. That's just nonsense. All it is, is that when you sit down at a table, you have more people to talk to. That's it. Yeah. And they're like you. If you taught them, they think like you, they look like you, they laugh like Lou. I mean, if you let the TV teach them, they'll be their own thing. But if you teach them, they'll be a lot like you. And so you'll be, again, multiplying and eating and drinking and rejoicing. 
I hope you all go home today and have a good Sunday dinner with somebody. I really do. Take some time to see each other. So Solomon reigned over all the kingdoms from the river to the land of the Philistines as far as Egypt. They brought tribute and served Solomon all the days of his life. That's the next text. So yeah, Jesus reigns. We're heir of the sun. There is no limit to his kingdom. It goes well past the Tigris and the Nile. He's not stuck there. He's all over the planet right now. So his kingdom far surpasses Solomon's kingdom. And indeed, there are Palestinians, Philistines, who are Christians. Uh, there are Egyptians who are Christians. Right? Christianity is everywhere now. There's almost no country in the world. There, there are a couple, but almost no country in the world where Christianity is not represented. And so Jesus reigns where heir of the sun. Uh, and then uh, they brought tribute, right? What are we doing here today? We're bringing tribute. We're serving Solomon. How? Isn't it interesting? Jesus is like, come serve me. How? Let me serve you. <laughs> uh, let me teach you the way you should go. Let me give you reasons for praising, right? And if you want to think about, you know, the, what is the service we have of God? It is prayer, praise, and thanks. Okay? You want to serve God this week? Pray. Um, it's, it's so hard. Our, our social distance world is so hard. But I had a cool moment this week um, that I didn't expect, and I want more of that in my life. And it's as simple as this. Uh, somebody said, I need prayer for something, and I just did it. Rather than say, I will. I've heard this before from pastors, and I've done it before. It's hard, though, in the moment. And so I know it's not just pastors also. Someone's just saying, I'm really worried about this. In fact, here's the story where it happened. I'll tell you, kids are going to get their, their story thrown in here. Uh, I was sitting on, this, on the, um, the, ah, the porch Friday mid-afternoon. It was still sunny out. Hadn't gotten, gotten nasty yet. And uh, um, three of my kids come out, and they want to go, go skateboarding at Skateboard Park over on Far West far east side, which I'm for that. I bought them skateboards. I've taken them. That's all great. But it's prom tonight. You go skateboarding? It's prom tonight. And my first thought, I mean, parents, anybody with me? I'm thinking elbow. I'm thinking wrist, right? That's where I'm at. Okay. And so what did I do? I, I said, you be careful. I didn't. I wanted to. That's what I usually do. Instead, I said, can I pray for you? And we huddled up and I prayed that they would be safe and have a great prom. And then I let them go. And I was still kind of like that parent, but, but it was better, way better than like telling them they should be careful. And I really suggest it. It's, it's a hard, it's a muscle, right? It's a muscle. You got to flex it. And it's going to be like, oh, I've never used it before. <laughs> you got to flex it. You got to do it again and again. Okay. So again, uh, bringing tribute to Jesus is to bring your words to Jesus. Pray, praise, give thanks. That's it. That's the only sacrifice left. It's not to gain something. It's as a result of something. But he does answer your prayers. Verse 22, provisions for his house. I mean, guys got so much going on. <laughs> I, I, I love the deer, gazelle, the fatted fowl. You know, he's got the oxen that have been raised pasture fed. He's got the fatted ones for the extra marbling. Did he eat it all himself? 30 oxen a day. I mean, he's got a kingdom to run. He's got people to pay, right? He's got cops and, and politicians and, and accountants and, and all this stuff. It's a big economy he's got going on. What I want you to see then is that Christ has that happening right now with his church just fine. He's got the whole world doing it right now just fine. And so then you get to live in your own little kingdom underneath that where you're going to have everything you need. Everything you need. And it's not going to be called 30, you know, fatted oxen. It's going to be way down uh, in verse 25, where it says, each man dwelt safely under his vine and his fig tree. Uh, um, before we get there, though, uh, verse 24, dominion everywhere, uh, river to Sipsa, even Gaza, and all that. Peace on every side. So again, that's going to be peace of conscience for you. Peace of conscience, peace of soul. And then each man dwells under his own vine and fig tree from Dan to Beersheba. That's from the far north to the far south. But vine and fig tree. So like you have enough. That is a fact that all of us just do well to believe more often. It doesn't matter what your situation is. You might in fact need something, but you do have enough, truly. You do. We all do. Why? Because God is in charge. And so therefore, it's what it's supposed to be. And I'm not saying don't act to change things that are bad and so forth like that. But what I am saying is that you may know that under the kingdom of the man of peace, 
your home is going to be provided for. You are going to find a smooth path. If you have not found a smooth path, if you are in poverty, come talk to me, by the way, and we can help a little. Um, but, but let me suggest that most Christians don't need that. Most don't. Widows need that. Widows need that, right? People in hard times need that. There are tragedies that occur that need to be helped. But by and large, you had food today, you had food yesterday, you had food the day before, your whole life you've had food. And it hasn't been something you had to fight for yet. I mean, that's, that's just America, let alone then God's actually promised for the even when you have to fight for it, you're going to get food, right? So Christians can have a certain level of understanding and confidence that the rest of the world doesn't have. As we face very terrible things, right? as we face fears and trials and whatever else may come our way, the kingdom of Solomon is one then that reigns uh, far greater than this ancient kind of pittance that he had. Uh, that's just a symbol and a picture of the kingdom of God now that you are a part of. And the fact that merely just sitting under your fig tree, well, that is, that's fine, but now you've been called into the priesthood of believers that under that fig tree you can pray. And believe where it came from. Know it will be sustained. Know that God has great plans for all of this, right? That there is a hope for your future. And that that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus, amen.